Hi, how are you? My name is Spencer Click. Uh, this morning I want to talk to you, or this afternoon, or this evening, whenever you're watching the video, I want to talk to you about uh, something that's very important to me, the concept of self-leadership. Today we're going to talk about uh, seven questions that we need to ask ourselves to find out if uh, we are leading ourselves well. I am convinced, 100% uh, convinced, that our ability to lead ourselves is uh, really going to dictate how well we can uh, go, or how far we can go in ministry, how far we can go in life. Uh, because honestly, um, there's nobody really there that has to push us. There's nobody there that is going to make you do something. You know, when you're a kid, your mom and dad are going to make you brush your teeth. They're going to make you make your bed, clean your room, do your homework. But once you become an adult, you're kind of on your own, uh, unless you've got a nagging spouse, uh, which that's not a good long-term solution. No, ultimately, we have to figure out how we are going to lead ourselves. So today, uh, I want to talk to you about that. Um, if, if you have seen Kid Men Leadership Book by Infuse, uh, you'll find out that this concept of self-leadership is something that's very important to me. It's something very near and dear to my heart. Uh, we've got another uh, Infuse Leadership Book coming out here very soon um, from uh, with Jim Weidman. It's, it's going to be a good book. Uh, it's talk about uh, things that are happening in children's ministry, leadership topics again. Uh, our favorite quotes uh, from other leaders and uh, from Jim Weidman, those are the, uh, the topics that were covered in that book. But in that book, I've, wrote, I've written another chapter, uh, and it again is very much on the same thing. It's talking about self-leadership. So I want, to, uh, I want you to understand, self-leadership is, I believe, absolutely vital. Uh, to your long-term term success in ministry. So I want to open up with a scripture this morning. Uh, it is in 2 Timothy 2.15, and it says, Do your best to present, present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the truth. Here's the question. How do we become a workman? 100% sure and certain uh, that we are approved unto God. How do we know that? We're going to do that by preparing ourselves for the ministry, preparing ourselves for the work that God has put, into, put ourselves into, and by uh, learning how to lead ourselves. Uh, when, we when we tend to think of leadership, we think in very general terms. We, we think, um, I want to learn the skills that are going to help me lead followers. Uh, it's, it's very important. We, when we talk leadership development, we, we most often talk about how am I going to lead my followers. Uh, but Bill Hybels talks about a concept called 360, 360 degree leadership. Uh, you've got your superiors above you, you've got you say, your pastor or your supervisor, whoever that might be. Uh, you have got the people below your subordinates, so uh, it could be a nursery director, a preschool director, any volunteers, that could be anybody. And then you've got peers, that would be other directors. Uh, that would be right along the same line as you, other pastors are along the same line as you. Uh, maybe it's the youth pastor. That's, uh, for some of us, we think the youth pastor is the most difficult leadership challenge that we face. But the reality is, the most difficult leadership challenge that we're going to face in a 360 leadership style is right in the middle. And that is you, or me. In my case, that's me. Uh, our, our, I am my most difficult leadership challenge, and uh, the more that I remember that, the longer I keep that in the mind, uh, the more I know I need to focus on learning how to lead myself. So when we're talking 360 degree leadership, we want to look at how am I leading myself. First Samuel chapter 30, and I'm sure many of you have seen this before, First Samuel chapter 30 shares a, um, a great example of how uh, David learned to lead himself. Now let me read it to you real quick. David and his man reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it. And they had, cap they had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. And when David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons taken captives. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured. The, wind, the widow of uh, Nabal of Carmel. I'm not very good on biblical names, so I'll skip them. Uh, David was greatly distressed because his men were talking of stoning him. How many of you have ever had a volunteer uh, group that you thought they were going to stone you? I, uh, we've all had those moments, I'm sure. Uh, each one was bitter in spirit because his sons and daughters, were, they, they've been carried off. But David, here's the key, but David found strength in the Lord his God. 
David sought out instruction and strength from God, and we need to be willing to do the same thing if uh, we're going to produce change in our lives. The scripture said that David encouraged himself in the Lord after he and his men returned to Ziklag and found it devastated by the enemies. David took a stand. He encouraged him in the Lord, himself in the Lord, so that he could continue to lead his followers. Ministry can be very difficult. One of the, the great hazards, uh, Pastor Gary Brothers has uh, said this before, he has said that uh, discouragement is the occupational hazard of ministry, which is very true. And if we don't learn how to encourage ourselves, just as David did, uh, when discouragement comes, when difficulty comes, when things and trials come down the way, guess what we're going to do? We're going to wallow. We're going to be, you know, we're going to get bitter. We're going to become self, self pitiers. There is nothing worse than a pity party. But if we can figure out how we need to lead ourselves and encourage ourselves in the Lord, guess what? We can do the same thing that David did, and we can learn how to lead our followers, even when we're dealing with discouragement. And this is truly the art of self-leadership. Here's what I want you to ask yourself. Who is responsible to make sure you are growing? Who is responsible to make sure that you're growing? The answer is nobody but yourself. It is not your pastor's job. It is not your supervisor's job. It's not even your follower's job. It's your job to make sure that you are growing. It is your job to make sure that you are leading yourself and encouraging yourself and continually moving forward. And there's several questions that I want you to ask yourself to help out to find out if you are growing as a leader and if you're doing well in the self-leadership test. Because really, here's the thing we need to know is that uh, leadership development is a process. It is a journey. It is a long-term commitment. There is never going to be a point where you know everything you need to know. There is never going to be a point where you've got it all figured out. And if you think you have it all figured out, then you probably didn't know all the questions to begin with. So I want you to be, make sure that you're asking yourselves these questions on a regular basis to help you move forward. Here's the first one. The first question I want you to ask yourself is, is my calling sure? Is my calling sure? Paul said this. He said, I consider my life worth nothing if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. Do you know for certain that the church you're at, that the ministry you're involved in, is where you're supposed to be? Do you know that for certain? If not, uh, you really need to spend some time praying. There is, there is nothing in this journey that is going to replace prayer. So here's the first question. Is my calling sure? And if you're not certain that God has called you to where you're at, guess what? You need to figure out where he wants you to be. Now, if, uh, if you are certain that this is where God's called you to be, if you are 100% sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that this is where God wants you, even if a better offer came along tomorrow, you wouldn't accept it because you know this is where God wants you, then uh, you need to learn that there are certain things you're going to have to deal with. A lot of times in children's ministry, uh, in ministry in general, it is very easy for us to complain, I, I jokingly said, about our youth pastor. Or it's easy for us to complain about our senior pastor. I was recently with a gathering of children's pastors uh, in, a, in an area, and um, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing how much they complained about their senior pastor, how much they complained about other staff pastors, how much they complained about their supervisors. It was incredible to me. So when I came back from that meeting, uh, I went to my senior pastor and I said, hey, I was reminded this weekend uh, how thankful I can be for you because uh, I get along great with my senior pastor. And it, it is a blessing. I am thankful for my church. I am thankful for the opportunities here. Um, and if you are certain... If you're 100% certain that this is where God has called you to, then guess what you have to do? You need to learn to uh, zip it up, stop complaining, and commit yourself 100% to the calling that God has put before you. That's the thing we have to do. We have to complete the task that the Lord Jesus Christ has put in front of us. That's why uh, when we say, yes, I know God called me for this ministry, uh, we have to learn to say, let's go then. I got I to gotta put aside hurt, I got to put aside bitterness, I got to put aside complaints, and I have got to learn to do the very best with what I have. I, I just, I want to, I want to be, I want a confession for you here. I, I want you to know this. Every church needs more volunteers. Every church needs more money. Every church needs more space. 
If you are working hard for the ministry, guess what? You're going to run into problems. Now, some churches call them opportunities. I call them problems because they're problems. They're things you got to figure out. But a problem should not derail you, especially if you are certain that this is where God wants you to be. If you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, 100%, my calling is clear, then you got to figure out how to work through the problems and make the best of what you've got and be the person God has called you to be where you're at. That's the first step in self-leadership is learning to make sure your calling is sure and then run with that. The second thing that you need to ask yourself, you need to ask yourself the question, is my vision clear? If my, is my vision clear? Uh, if the leader isn't sure where we're going, then nobody else is going to know either. Nobody else is going to know uh, when you get there. Nobody else is going to know if you're heading in the right direction. And your followers will eventually just start to fade away. They'll start to drop off because they're not going to know where you're going. They're going to miss the, the point of what you're doing. So you have to ask yourself the question, is my vision clear? Is my vision clear? Uh, imagine if you got an airplane. Hop in an airplane and the, uh, the pilot says, well, hey, we're not sure where we're going to go. Um, so we're just going to take off and see where we make it, see where we're, we end up. We've got enough fuel to drive, you know, fly around for a little bit. How many of you would be comfortable on that plane? Uh, some of you probably aren't comfortable on planes to begin with. Uh, that's why you're attending a, a conference over the internet. But uh, the reality is we wouldn't be comfortable with a, a, a pilot that does that. So why should we expect our followers to be comfortable when we do that in ministry? Is my vision clear? Now in children's ministry, here's the great thing. Uh, we don't have to figure out what the vision is for the whole church. And since we don't have to figure that out, our vision for children's ministry is not a separate vision from what the church's vision is. So I'll give you an example of my church. I, I, I'm at Bethel Church in Hampton, Virginia. Uh, we sum up our vision in the word dream. Uh, demonstrate reconciliation, reshape the future, experience life, activate hope, and multiply influence. So what does that mean? Demonstrate reconciliation. That means that we want to make sure that when we are equipping leaders, when we are finding leaders, we are maintaining what matches our congregation. So our, our church is 70% African American. So I don't, want to make, I don't want all the leadership in my children's ministry uh, to be Caucasian. I want, I want there to be a, a fair mix. Why? Because that way we are making sure that we continue to demonstrate reconciliation. We also want to make sure that we are uh, inviting young, i.e. 7th, 8th graders, and old, i.e. Our, our senior adult ministry, whether, whatever it is. We want to, we want to have a, a multi-generation involved in our children's ministry. We don't want to have a single generation involved. That's how we demonstrate, uh, that's how we demonstrate reconciliation. Reshape the future. We want to make sure that we're doing a, a significant investment in the future generation, in our current generation, to change the future. Now that is children's and youth ministry, and that is the foundation uh, of the vision that I have here in our church. We, when we talk to, when I talk to new volunteers, when I talk to leaders, I tell them, listen, when you want to know why we do what we do, we're, we're the R in the dream. We are reshaping the future. We are changing children's lives by investing in them, by leading them, by caring about them, by sharing with them, by teaching them. We are changing their lives and we are reshaping the future. Experience life, that's why our children's ministry, we do a large group, small group, because we believe life is better when you experience it in relationship. We uh, activate hope. How do we do that? We do it through children's ministry outreaches. We just uh, completed uh, passing out all of our take-home Easter egg kits. Now, it's more fun to do a big event. We love big events. They're a lot of fun. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that our kids could be involved in inviting their friends to an egg hunt and sharing the gospel. So that we gave them a take-home egg kit. And that's consistent with uh, how we do things in children's ministry, how we do things as a church. Because that's the A, activate hope. We want to activate hope throughout the community by sharing the love of Christ. And then the M is multiply influence. Uh, that's why I, I've got a blog. That's why I do uh, training events for our, our people. That's why we partner with other churches in the area to see how we can help them. We do what we can to, uh, we just hosted a, a VBS training day for group if you're doing Sky VBS, we, we did that here. Was that because it benefited us a great deal? No, not really. It, it cost us some money to put on. It cost us a, a lot of time to host. But it made us build relationships with other churches. That's how we multiply influence. Now, when I talk about the, ch the children's ministry vision, guess what? It's the same thing. Demonstrate reconciliation, reshape the future, experience life, activate hope, multiply influence. So when you're asking, is my vision clear? You have to ask yourself, does the vision that my senior pastor have 
Does it match the vision I have for children's ministry? Does it match what I want to do for children's ministry? And if your vision doesn't match your senior pastor's vision, then you might either need to reevaluate your vision or find a place where your vision fits uh, because you are not the head of that church and your vision has to line up with the vision for that church. We have to understand that the leader's role is to determine the destination of the organization and your destination that you have in mind should be the same place that your senior pastor wants to go. So when we're asking the question for self-leadership, is my calling sure, is my vision clear, is my vision clear, do I know where we're going, and does it match where my senior pastor is going? The third question I want you to ask yourself is, is my passion hot? Are you enthusiastic for what you're doing? This is a fundamental question in self-leadership. Is my passion hot? Are, we, are you excited about what you're doing? If, if you don't enjoy what you're doing, uh, there are plenty of other things to do. Uh, you don't have to do what you're doing right now. You get the choice. Now, if your calling is sure and your vision's clear, your passion's going to be hot. Um, but if your passion's not hot, then you've probably fallen into the trap that uh, Pastor Tommy Barnett out at Phoenix First in Arizona shared. Uh, he says if, you're, uh, if, your passion's, if your passion's cooled off, if you're not excited, the reason is, is because your vision is too small. You don't see the, the impact that you're having. You might, you might be at a church where you only have 25 kids coming every week, and you're, you're like, well, I just feel like I'm babysitting. And guess what? For those 25 kids, you are one of the most important people they will see that entire week. This should get your passion ramped up. This should get you excited about what you're doing. You should love what you're doing and you should be passionate about it because of the impact that you have. If you're not excited about what you're doing, there are plenty of other things to do. There are plenty of other ways to minister. There are plenty of other ways that you can have an impact in the kingdom. So let me encourage you. Make sure that you're asking that question. Are you thrilled to be serving in the area of ministry that you're serving in? Are you thrilled? Do you love it? I hope you do. Um, and if you're not thrilled, you either need to figure out why you're not thrilled <laughs> or you need to find a place where you will be passionate and enthusiastic about what you're doing. Really, let me encourage you to do that. Uh, the fourth question I want you to ask is, am I developing my gifts? Am I develop developing my gifts? A lot of uh, leadership stuff to, out there today is, uh, if you've seen the strength finders, if you've seen the strength base, this is an important thing. You need to know what you're good at. Do you know what you're good at? How many of you, um, how many of you have an idea of what your spiritual gift is? If, if you're ask, if you're asking, see, I know my spiritual gifts: teaching, preaching, uh, and administrative. I'm, I'm very administrative in how I do things. Um, I know those things. But you need to ask your question. Ask, ask yourself a question: um, Are you developing your gifts? Now, a lot of times in leadership, um, we think about only focusing on uh, weaknesses. Now. I think it's important that we, we work on our weaknesses. Now, there's some, there are some leadership systems out there that don't encourage you to focus on a weakness. They want you just to work on your strengths uh, and then hire people or find volunteers to cover your weaknesses. Now, that's important uh, because if you, it's a weakness, you do need help. We need to recognize that. But you also have to understand that you have to work on your strengths and your weaknesses uh, because a weakness will always be a weakness unless you work on developing it. But in that process, we cannot take for granted the gifts that God has given us. God has given you a great gift. Everybody that's watching this video right now, God has given you an amazing gift. You have it. You have a talent. You have a gift. You have something that you do amazingly well. And if you're not spending time developing it, if you're not spending time working on that, if you're not spending time making sure that that gift stays sharp, guess what? It's going to drop off. Now, you'll probably still do it decent. You'll probably still do it okay. You'll probably, you know, but if you don't work on it, it's going to take you a long time to uh, make sure that it's growing. Let me give you, I'll give you an example. When I was, uh, when I was in college, when I was, uh, when I, actually, when I was 13, I learned how to uh, clown. The children's pastor I worked with taught me all the uh, basics of clowning. He taught me how to do my makeup and all this. Um, he taught me a lot of, and I, I, I did a clown character in kids' church growing up uh, for, you know, six or seven years. You know, from the time I was 13 until I, I left for college, I did, I did a clown character probably, you know, every other month we did that. We would do events with clown ministry. When I went to, when I went to college, I headed up their clown team. Um, I, did, we, I, I did that for two years. Uh, came, out of chil came out of college with a, a children's ministry degree. Uh, the church I went at, I, we, the clowns was great. There was great. The things, things really went well with that. I, 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 
when I first started clowning, it would take me a good 45 minutes to put on my makeup, you know, get everything straight, look, make it all look good. By the time when I was clowning the most, when I was leading the clown team at, at college and when I was uh, doing a lot of outreach events, I had gotten my, doing my makeup down to 15 minutes. I mean, I could, it, it, everything was great, it looked perfect, everything went well. I have not done uh, my clown character in probably about four years. Uh, first of all, it creeps out my wife, so um, we, don't, we don't do that very often anymore. She doesn't, she doesn't really like it. Uh, but also, my, my role in ministry has changed. Uh, I'm, a, I'm in a, a different ministry position. I've got uh, more people that do... Uh, I spend more time with leaders than I do with kids. So I don't, I don't always have the opportunity to clown. Um, so I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't done any clowning in you know, probably four, yeah, four, close to five years. Uh, so if I were to do my makeup, I still remember what it looks like. Um, but it would take me... It'd take me 45 minutes to an hour to do it. It would take me forever to get that ready. Why? Because I haven't worked on it. I haven't spent any time paying attention to it. So if you have a gift, don't take it for granted. I want you to understand that you need to pay attention to how God has gifted you. And you need to work on it. If you're naturally gifted on uh, administration, you can't always assume that you'll always have that working for you. So you need to work on that. Uh, we need to make sure that we are developing our gifts. And if you are a growing leader, and if you're leading yourself, guess what you're doing? You're developing your gifts. Here's the, uh, the fifth question that I want you guys to ask yourself. It, uh, it's, it's an important question, especially because um, it is easy when you are up front, when you're the person in front, to lose sight of this. Here's question number five. Is my pride subdued? Is my pride subdued? Uh, I don't know if you've ever read uh, Built to Last or Good to Great by Jim Collins. They're both wonderful books. Uh, they are great books, and in those books, he, uh, he profiles several companies. He profiles several companies that were just done so well, that were, that were built so well and um, had great longevity, great history, that they were, they, you know, like built to last. These companies are so good, they're never going to fail. Uh, good to great, these are companies that went from, you know, here to here, and they, they were just fantastic. Um, in his follow-up book to those, <laughs> Jim Collins... Uh, in Why the Mighty Fall, <laughs> he talks about what caused the companies that he profiled in Built to Last and Good to Great, what caused them to fail. Because several of those companies that he, he talked about being just wonderful companies, uh, several of them failed. And one of the primary reasons, the first thing that they saw was hubris, born of success. What's that mean? Pride. They were proud. They, they got prideful. They got, they got excited about how they were successful. They got they enthusiastic about how they were doing things well. And either they got cocky and arrogant and uh, quit doing the things that got them to where they're at. Um, or uh, they just started coasting. They thought, hey, I've arrived. I'm at some place. This is where I'm at. I'm going to be doing great. I don't need to worry about anything. And in doing that, they shot themselves in the foot and they finally failed. They finally failed. Why? Because they've got prideful. They got prideful, and it changed them. It affected how they were. As leaders, we have to look at uh, what level of success we're having. And we have to ask, am I keeping my pride subdued? Now understand, there's a, there's a difference between... Um, let's see how I want to say it. When we say being humble, being humble uh, does not mean denying that you have gifts. That's, that doesn't want, it's not what it means, okay? We, we, have, we have gifts. You're going to have gifts. You have gifts. It's great. Wonderful. God gave you gifts for a reason. He gave you gifts for you to use them. But uh, a lot of times people think being humble is denying your strengths. No, being humble is um, recognizing your strengths come from God. That you are where you're at because God has placed you there. And your gifts are not yours. They're not your own. See, if we, if we um, lose sight of our humility and we lose sight of it and we become prideful because we're doing well, and I'm sure one of, many of you are doing just a fabulous job at your church. I'm sure you all are just doing a great job. But if we lose sight of the fact that we're not doing it on our own and that God is helping us, uh, we're going to become prideful. We're going to uh, get overwhelmed. We're going we're gonna to start thinking that uh, we really are as spectacular as we think, are, think we are. And here's something that can really help us. 1 Peter 5.5 5, uh, puts it like this. It says, God opposes the proud, 
but gives grace to the humble. Well, here's what he's saying. As a leader, we have a choice. Uh, do we want God to be for us, or do we want God to be against us? If we want God to be for us, what do we need to do? We need to remain humble. I, I have been blessed in many wonderful ways by God, and I understand that I am where I'm at, because God has placed me there. Promotion comes from God. So, if we're making sure that our calling is sure, that our vision is clear, uh, that we are, our passion is hot, uh, that our pride is subdued, that we're developing our gifts, um, if, we're, if we're making sure all of these things are happening, keeping our pride in check should be easier. Because we recognize that our vision and our calling, all of it comes from God. And as long as we keep that in mind, it will help us keep our pride in check. Check. And when we lose sight of that, when we lose sight of um, God has put us where we're at, then we start thinking, and then we start thinking that we're doing something great. We start thinking that we we deserve what we got. We deserve to be where we're at. And the reality is that, um, but for the grace of God, go I. Without God's grace, none of us would be where we're at. God has done such a wonderful job for us. He has done so many great gifts and blessings for us. Without God. We don't get where we're at. Without God, we don't find forgiveness. We don't find grace. We don't find blessings. So that should help us keep our pride subdued. Because I want God on my side. I don't want God to oppose me. I want God to be on my side. So when we ask ourselves, is my pride subdued? Hopefully uh, we can answer yes. And if you don't know how you're doing, uh, ask one of the people in your ministry. I'm sure they would be more than happy to help you out uh, in keeping in mind whether your pride is being subdued. Here's question number six. This is a hard one. It's, it's uh, Am I Facing My Dark Side? Uh, there's a great book out there called Overcoming the Dark Side of Leadership. It's by uh, Rima and McIntosh. Great book. Love it. Talks about different qualities of a leader, different traits of a leader. Has some self-evaluations and examinations in there that you can take to help you figure out where your dark side of leadership. You know, if, if leadership's got a positive side, it's kind of like the force. If there's a good side, there's a bad side. Uh, and that's what it is. We have to ask ourselves, are we understanding... Uh, and where we're working on our dark side. We have to understand, some people don't want to admit that they have faults. Um, as, a, um, as a reformed, um, prideful perfectionist, let me tell you, I've got faults, you've got faults. We all have issues that we're working on. We all have issues that we need to pay attention to. Uh, and we have to ask ourselves, am I overcoming my dark side? Now, what's your dark side of leadership? You know, the dark side of leadership are those times when you uh, bark at a volunteer. When you overreact to something, I don't know if you've ever overreacted to something. I know I have, um, but if you overreact to something, you need to stop. You need to stop and ask yourself a question: Why did that set me off like that? Why did I do that? What, what, what was the deal? I don't. I don't know if you've ever if you've ever done that, or maybe you think every time that you blow up, everything every time, and maybe you don't blow up. Maybe you just um, maybe you go into a depression. Maybe oh oh, and you you, you do. All of us respond differently to strong emotions. Some people, some people get depressed, some people get mad, some people cry, some people giggle. Um, I am not a giggly person. I'm, it's just it's a fact of life. Um, but any time that you go into one of those things, maybe, maybe you had a great Sunday, somebody made a comment that kind of set you off a little bit, you, just on, at the end of the day, and maybe you went home and you just you walk around, oh man, I stink. I'm awful. Nobody really loves me. All of a sudden, you're Eeyore from one comment. Why? That's the dark side of leadership. You need to figure out what it is about you. What is it inside of you that um, you need to address? And these are questions that you have to ask internally. And these, these are things that personality profiles, uh, like the PEP test, the uh, path element profile from uh, Lori Beth Jones, or, or the DISC, or Myers-Briggs, all of these are, are tools that can help you see uh, emotional stuff going on in you. Uh, if you are all, if if you have an insatiable need to be in charge all the time, if you can't learn to sit back and let somebody else do something, you need to ask yourself why. You need to figure out uh, why do I have this compulsive need to be in charge. So let me give you some questions uh, when you're when you're asking when you're trying to figure out um, if you are overcoming your dark side. If you're facing your dark side, you need to ask yourself ask yourself questions after the event. Why did I say that? Why did I do that? Um, why, you know, so ask yourself, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why did I behave like that? Have you ever stormed out of a meeting? Where in adult behavior did that become appropriate? 
Where in adult behavior did it become okay to say things that you knew were going to be hurtful? That's dark side. That's the, the negative side of being in charge. Uh, why did I power up on an issue? Sometimes when we're in charge, I had a, uh, a youth pastor I worked with when I was a teenager. Now, this, he was my youth pastor. And uh, he looked at me one time after I, I gave him a little pushback on an issue. And he looked at me and he goes, Spencer, I am the youth pastor. I am not wrong. I laughed. Uh, it probably wasn't helpful to the situation. I laughed at that point in time. Uh, and I told him, said, I, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that being a youth pastor made you infallible. But if you have ever squashed an issue by going, because I said so, because I'm in charge, uh, you're not leading well. Because leaders, the, the followers want the answer to the question, why? That's what they want. But more than so, when you feel the need, there's, there's been times that people have asked me questions and maybe we didn't get along great, maybe we weren't uh, the best of friends in ministry, and I had to really slow down and go, whoa, hang on, why am I reacting negatively to this? I had an individual I worked with on staff that um, for the first six months I was there, we didn't get along. And I couldn't figure out why we didn't get along. And after, after about six months, I was, I was able to really sit down and think through it for myself. And I, here's what I decided. Uh, they reminded me of somebody else. It was something in my, my history that caused me to have a negative reaction to them. That's something I had to recognize. I had to learn that. That's the dark side of leadership. Is, and you have to be willing to face it. And it's hard stuff. Self-leadership, nobody said it was easy. Nobody said it was going to be simple. Nobody said that it was always going to be fun. You have to be willing to look at difficult things. In, uh, in your book here, or not in your book, on, your, on the bottom of your notes, I'm going to include some uh, resources that you can read. Uh, some of them are kind of deep. Some of them are uh, kind of surface stuff. But I'll give you a list of books that I think will be helpful uh, to help you in facing your dark side, to help you in overcoming things. Um, how many of you have ever met a, met a bitter person? You ever met a bitter, bitter person? You know what bitterness comes from? It's when somebody hasn't learned to deal with a problem that they faced before. And so it just it gets deeper into them, deeper into them, deeper into them, deeper into them, until finally it's in the very heart of where they're at, the very heart of who they are. And we know what's on the inside is going to come out. So if you've got ugliness coming out around you, guess what? You're probably not facing your dark side. So you have to ask yourself the question, uh, am I facing my dark side? So that's, uh, that's one of the keys to self-leadership. It demands that you face your dark side. It demands that you answer the questions, why did I do that? What are the negative qualities I need to address? That is absolutely vital to self-leadership. And then here's a, the seventh question I want you to ask. Uh, is my love for God and my love for people increasing? Is my love for God and my love for people increasing? I just talked to uh, several of my employees this morning, some of our uh, key leaders at church this morning, and we spent, uh, we spent a good portion of the morning just talking about this. People come before projects. People come before projects. In the church, we are doing a huge amount of massive work with a volunteer force. We have to make sure that we're continuing to love people. We have to make sure that our love for people is increasing. If we become, I, I had a Bible college, in, um, I had a Bible college professor one time that jokingly said, he said, um, ministry would be great if it wasn't for the people. Well, he, he was joking because without the people, guess what? There is no ministry. Without the people, you don't have a children's ministry. Without your volunteers, you don't have anything to do. Because you can't do it all by yourself. So is your love for people increasing? And more importantly, is your love for God increasing? Like I said earlier, discouragement is the occupational hazard of ministry. And it's easy to feel overwhelmed. It is easy to feel like you just can't get it done. And I'll let somebody else talk to you about how you, how you get it done, how time management skills and, and task management, that kind of stuff. Uh, but if you're feeling overwhelmed... If you're feeling like you're losing sight of the passion and the vision and the calling that God has for you, you need to stop. Not stop ministry completely necessarily, but you need to stop and start asking yourselves hard questions. Ask yourself a question. Why? Why don't I love what I'm doing? Why does that person bother me so much? Why was I so on edge today? Why did I blow up at that kid? We know that he's going to be a problem every week. I don't have to yell at them. I can correct them in love. We have to ask ourselves, 
Is my passion for God and my passion for people increasing? If we don't do that, we are going to find ourselves in this loop, this habit, this problem, this situation in life that makes us miserable. Makes us miserable. God has called you to greatness. God has called you to be amazing. And we have to be willing to ask ourselves difficult questions in order to lead ourselves. Self-leadership demands that we ask that question. Uh, is my love for God increasing? Is my love for people increasing? Have you, uh, have you reminded yourself recently whose job it is to fan the flame of passion for God and people? Whose job is it? It's your job. Not your pastor's job. Not your church's job. It's not your spouse's job. It's not your volunteer's job. It's your job. So the seven questions that we asked here, seven questions that we asked here, is my calling sure? Is my passion clear? I'm sorry. Is my calling sure? Is my vision clear? Is my passion hot? Am I developing my gifts? Is my pride subdued? Am I facing my dark side? And is my love for God and for people increasing? What do you need to face? What do you need to face? Leading those below us, leading those beside us, leading those above us is nothing and compared to trying to lead myself. I am my most difficult leadership challenge. Now for me, what does self-leadership look like? Self-leadership looks like uh, working with assessments. I, 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 use, I have been assessed like you would not believe. Um, but leadership uh, development for me, here I'll, I'll share with you my path. Okay? Children's pastor for, I've been doing this now for 15 years. Uh, I've been working in children's ministry since I was 12, so 24 years. Yeah, I'm 36. Okay? Um, so I went to college. Not everyone, not everyone feels the need to go to college. That's okay. Um, but this was the path for me. I went to college. I got a bachelor's degree in children's ministry. After I graduated from college, what I do? Uh, I went to conference for, conferences for several years, CPC, uh, other conferences out there. I, I went to Dream Conference when uh, Jim Wideman was at Church on the Move. I went to that. I did, I did conferences to try and build my skills, okay? And then after that, after several years of that, um, Jim Wideman launched a mentoring program called Infuse. And uh, that, for me, was the next step because um, I had learned the, the what. I had learned the how-tos of a lot of stuff. Uh, I want to learn the next step, which is the why, the principles of, of why we do what we do. So Infuse, I did two years of that with, with Brother Jim. Uh, I did two years of that. And then coming out of that, um, it seemed like the next logical step. I needed to grow. I need, I need to continue to grow. Well, I've done, I've done my bachelor's. I've done tons of conferences. I love conferences. I really do. I'm, I'm like a conference junkie. Um, I loved my time with Brother Jim. Uh, great time. I've actually stuck around with them. I help them out as a coach for Infuse. Um, and then after that, I really felt that it was appropriate to, uh, I went on to get my master's. I, I'm, I'm, I, I am uh, 45 pages away from finishing my final paper uh, for my master's degree. So um, May, May 5th, feel free to send me a, a congratulations or a, a gift. I accept money. Uh, but I, I went through my master's program. And so now here I am, I've got I've got one month left in the master's program, and I'm asking myself, what's next? What's my next step? What am I going to do next to continue to grow as a leader? It's nobody else's job. Nobody else's job to ask that question. It is your job to ask that question. That's what my path looked like. Your path might look different, but let me encourage you. Okay, let me encourage you in this. Uh, there are tons of great leadership resources out there, tons of great blogs. Uh, break out of your, break out of your, uh, Break out of your little box, okay? If all you ever read is a children's ministry how-to, uh, you need to start reading leadership development stuff. If all you ever read is leadership development stuff, then you probably need to read some children's ministry how-to, and you probably need to read some spiritual development stuff. See, I was, I'm great about leadership development stuff, but reading spiritual development stuff, that's when it really gets into the heart of who I am. You need to look for blind spots that you have in your development, blind spots that you have inside of you and when you find them, start pursuing resources that are going to help encourage you. I don't have anything that I'm selling today. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm, I want to see you. I've decided that, this is what I decided. Actually, I decided this uh, last week, or two weeks ago. Um, God has called me to help other leaders. So that means for some leaders, I'm going to serve them, whatever they need. 
Uh, I've got several that I've just told them, anytime you need something, give me a call. I would be more than happy. Uh, I'd be more than happy to do it. Other leaders, my job is to provide resources for them. And then there's other leaders that my job is to help challenge them. And that's my hope for you today, is that I want to challenge you to start asking yourselves questions. Ask yourself these questions. Am I calling sure? Is my vision clear? Is my passion hot? Am I developing my gifts? Is my pride subdued? Am I facing my dark side? Is my love for God and people increase? And then ask yourself this last question as we close here. Ask yourself this last question. What is the next step in my developmental journey? What is the next step in my developmental journey? Well, I hope you guys enjoyed it today. Thanks for listening. You can find me online. My uh, website is spencerclick.com. You can find me on Twitter. At, my username is spencerclick. You can email me if you want, spencer at spencerclick.com. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash spencer.click. I'm really hard to find. If you can remember my name, Spencer Click, you can find me online. So thanks a lot. Look forward to hearing from you. God bless.